Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com and Bitemoutlive.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is Friday, May 28, 2021, and this is our weekly video. We'll look back, and we're going to take a look, as we always do, at how some things did over on eBay and Katawiki last week. But we're going to do something a little different this week because there were some sales that took place in uh, Hong Kong. And uh, as some of you know, that have been in touch with me. I had some surgery on my hand. Uh, I severed some tendons, uh, finger damage, and I was out of the office for most of the last, uh, about the last week, actually, uh, getting ready to have surgery, which was done. It was successful, but it's going to be another three weeks or so before I can get the use of my left hand back. So I'm walking around with somewhat limited abilities at the moment. Uh, especially with keyboards and computers. But at any rate, I'm here. And um, I thought it would be fun to take a look uh, as a sort of a change this week at the Christie sale, because I don't know if, when I'm going to get time to do a full review of all of them. And you've got the, the second part of the Great Caverns sale coming up with some nifty things I saw in there, and I'm going to talk about those in another video. But uh, I wanted to take a look and see what was going on in Hong Kong this week, because it's been up and down. It was a mixed bag. Uh, as some of you know, uh, Sotheby's had the uh, uh, China trade auction, Chinese export porcelain auction and uh, the, the stuff was just overestimated uh, apparently according to the buyers and uh, they had a huge buy-in rate I don't know what it was but I'm gonna say it was around 70% of the sale didn't make reserves uh, this is a, a problem with sellers these days uh, this is not 2011 and 2012 you can just throw any number on it and get it um, and the auction houses starting to uh, really push consigners just to relax on the on the estimates and and, and going for the gold every time uh, be sensible and try to get attention more than scare people away with high estimates and uh, they were successful in doing that with two sales in particular this past week one of them was this this was the heavening heavening hall heavening hall auction of the chinese furniture this is the estate it's an amazing estate it's a, it's a it's a level one uh, in, in the in the in england they rank uh, the importance of properties level one level two level three there are very few level ones. This particular place is one of them uh, where this furniture was collected by uh, uh, a wealthy British guy named John Hunt owns the property. He bought it back in the early 90s, 93, 94, as a private residence. And um, I think I think now they're sort of converting it to other things. They're going to be doing fox hunting from there. And uh, here they had a big country fair there back in 2013 just for the fun of it. It's quite a property. And uh, inside the house it was, there's re was, is there was their residence. And he got an interest in Chinese furniture in the 90s and, and uh, collected about 24 very important pieces. And they were just sold. Um, I guess he's moving on to other types of collections for now. But at any rate, it was all top-notch stuff, and the prices were quite excellent. And uh, we're going to go through some of the prices to give you an idea. Because as we all have seen in the last few months, um, in the last year or so, rather, uh, Chinese furniture has been extremely strong. Chinese furniture has been fantastically strong. We've seen Chinese porcelain monochromes have seems to have gotten a bit softer or not quite the excitement that they had a while ago, other than very, very early, very rare pieces, uh, but but in, in other areas. But we're seeing a very a lot of strength in um, uh, especially imperial porcelain, the Qing Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, rare examples that have been off the market for a while, doing very well. Uh, fine silks and textiles are getting a lot of interest, and, and they've been strong all through. Uh, fine, fine cloisonne, especially imperial cloisonne, and uh, and furniture, and 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 of course modern Chinese paintings are going out of control. But at any rate, we're onto the furniture here, and this is a very nice late Ming 19th century Huanwali round cornered tapered cabinet with stand, which is unusual. There's a stand on the bottom. Often it's just the upper section that's left. Um, and this sold for 6850000 Hong Kong, which is about seven and a half uh, or so million dollars, roughly. Uh, I mean, $750,000, not seven and a half million, $750,000. Mm -hmm. Did quite well. It was a wonderful thing. It uh, pretty much uh, almost doubled its high estimate, just missed doubling its high estimate. Beautiful example, uh, very high quality grain of wood. When Juan Wally cabinets, you always want to, there's Juan Wally and then there's Great Juan Wally, and you always want to examine the uh, the graining of the wood. How, how good a job did they do of the wood? And also these, you'll notice this very complex series of members and structures holding the case together. Beautifully done hard, hardware, uh, most certainly original. And then this very uh, complicated three section base underneath. Very, very interesting, beautifully done. And did well. Brought almost, uh, you know, uh, seven hundred fifty, eight hundred thousand dollars U.S. 
quite a good job, quite a good thing. And then this, the compound cabinet, another one, uh, massive Juan Wally uh, compound cabinets. They made lots of these. They're always in demand. People always love them. And this one sold for about $450,000. Uh, uh, again, well over its high estimate of uh, 1.5 to 2 million Hong Kong. Uh, so we'll do a quick head translation. So 3.2 uh, million Hong Kong comes out to around... Uh, uh, $370,000 or so, roughly, within 10% of that. All right, very nice cabinet, though. Beautiful color, warm honey tones to it, and uh, good-looking, well-placed hardware. And then on to this. This doesn't look like much, but it's in a really, really rare Zeton uh, folding stool. These folding stools were, are, are quite rare, uh, mainly because a lot of them that they, they were made just got broken and damaged and lost, and and uh, they'd fall apart because they're mechanical. But this is a nice old one. Uh, I suspect it's been refabricated and so forth. But um, often they were damaged and they didn't survive. Just simple as that. And this one sold for 2.5 million Hong Kong or around $300,000 US roughly. Uh, very, very rare thing. It had a very nice lower section here with this cutout skirt going along here. Quite attractive and good color. Very nice color throughout. And then this. These are something interesting because they, they were from the uh, uh, Imperial Palace from the wedding chamber. Uh, these were large Zetan lanterns. They measured about 28 inches tall, and they had previously been handled by the American dealer Hatfield in, in uh, New York. Uh, absolutely uh, stupendous pair. Really, really beautiful. There's only a few of these known. A few of these lanterns survived, again, because of their fragility and so forth. And um, uh, uh, Robert uh, Hatfield Ellsworth, uh, the, the legendary dealer, I called him Hatfield, it's Ellsworth, in New York. Here it is. He had them um, uh, in 1978, and then they sold in, 19, in 2015 to Heavening and Hall uh, collection. That is when uh, I assume Mr. Hunt bought them. But fantastically rare. And uh, you just don't see them in beautifully carved. And they sold for five million Hong Kong, or, or around six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the pair. Uh, but absolutely spectacular quality. And there's a good write-up on them. Always check down at the bottom of these lot essays, and they'll tell you more about it. And here it tells you: uh, Imperial Wedding Chamber in the Palace of Earthly Repose, illustrated by Wen Wan Go on and Yang Boda, Treasures of the Forbidden City. That was that famous book that came back out in the early 80s that was one of the first really good Western English books on Chinese furniture and Imperial Palace and so forth. And uh, they illustrated a pair of them in there. All right, and then on to this. This was the big gun in the sale. Uh, these unbelievably rare Huan Huali metal fitted folding uh, uh, Imperial chairs. Basically, these were for the emperor or very, very high ranking government officials. Not many of them survived. They are among the rarest of all Chinese furniture forms for obvious reasons. And uh, the emperor had these, and when he traveled, this would one of these or a couple of these chairs would travel with him, and he could open them up and have a, have a very nice place to sit wherever he was when he was traveling or going on a campaign or something. They're beautifully, beautifully made, very precisely made. Uh, and this one was in exceptionally fine condition. Really, really was. Beautifully done. And a nice warm honey color again in the wood, beautifully carved backsplat with this uh, Kieran and uh, clouds and so forth, and then a dragon up above. Uh, beautifully done. A great, these are uh, incredibly rare. Um, a lot of fakes of them around. This is a real one. And it ended up selling for 65 million, 975,000 Hong Kong dollars, or around, that works out to about $8 million US. Uh, but again, a fantastically rare piece of furniture, just uh, stunningly rare. And this one has very good color and perfectly made. Uh, and, and like I said, they don't, there weren't many of them to begin with because they were only for the imperial, you know, imperial people and very important people. And uh, the whole sale did well. The whole auction did well over here. Uh, if you go through it, you'll see that every piece I believe sold, everything sold within its estimate or well above it. Uh, like this compound cabinet was estimated at one and a half to two, sold for three. Uh, the uh, uh, this uh, chair was estimated at 600 to 800 thousand Hong Kong sold for 750 on the upper end. Same for the stool, and you can go through it, and you can see that the, the furniture market is remaining very very strong. In particular, for for, for, for the, the very fine Ming Huan Wall Li and Zitan pieces, and early 18th century Qing, Qing furniture forms uh, into the Qing Dynasty, uh, Qin, uh, Qinlung period. 
But um, this sale did really, really well. Did Bravo. Nice stuff. And uh, then moseying on over to the Chinese, uh, important Chinese works of art sale. We'll get to it. There it is. This sale did very well. Like I said, some of the monochromes are a little bit squishy, but uh, you have these uh, fantastic series of cloisonne pieces. You may remember a few months ago, there were some jades that were put in here from the, um, um, uh, uh, let's, let's hop over to this here. I'm gonna get to it right here. These, we're gonna talk about the cloisonne in a minute, but I, I wanna cover quickly what it is. A few months ago, you remember some jades came from this place, the George Walter Vincent Smith Museum here in Springfield, Massachusetts. They were all, everything in the museum was acquired prior to 1910. And the museum's on sort of an expansion thing, uh, a lot of way a lot of museums are. And a lot of museums have lost money during the, during the pandemic because they're not open. Uh, patronage has slid off. People aren't, you know, maybe doing what they should to keep their memberships alive, even though they, they can't attend the museum. When bad times come, you got to keep giving money to local museums because you want them there when the things are over and uh, do the best you can with that. But the museum, I don't know if that's the reason, is deaccessioning quite a few things. They sold the jades a few months ago, as you recall. They all did fabulously well. And this time around, they decided to deaccession some of their cloisonne pieces, which they have a lot of. There's a big collection of Asian art in this museum. These are just some of them. And uh, this was the top lot among the jade pieces, though, from the, uh, from the Smith Museum, is this really, really rare um, Shao enamel Chin Lung um, uh, uh, and Bakshan uh, pear-shaped vase. And uh, what it is is the Shao character, obviously, is in the center here, which is a symbol for you know, longevity and good luck. And then the Bakshian aspect of the eight uh, Buddhist uh, 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 precious objects floating around the outside of it. Fantastically rare piece of cloisonne, beautifully done, uh, just top, top notch quality, obviously. Look at the way the base is done with this fret border and this beautifully uh, sort of boule red in gilt uh, flaming uh, mandala around, around the Shao character for a long life. Then you have the Buddhist symbols. And then you have this beautiful, soft, almost celery green uh, 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 enamel in here. It's quite an unusual color. And then dragons going up the neck. Um, and then again, the uh, upper fret pattern is repeated. And this piece is in absolutely splendid condition. Um, this was a big thing with the Smith Collection. A lot of the stuff was bought so early, came to a United States museum, been beautifully taken care of, and all in very, very fine condition. And this ended up selling for $7,690,000, or about $870,000, $850,000, or $900,000, roughly. Beautiful example. If you like cloisonne, and this shows you that the, the cloisonne has been off the market for a long time, especially imperial cloisonne, big demand for it, big demand. And then you have this, this very fine five-piece altar uh, an enamel set. I think the biggest piece in here is about 20, no, 20 inches, 17 and a half inches tall. And here you have the pricket stick, the, uh, the goo form vases, and of course the sensor in the middle. Beautiful, beautiful example. And again, in outstanding condition. Absolutely great condition. Wonderful, intricate lid, all reticulated with the original uh, not finial open work on top. Often these are missing and they've been replaced with other things. So that's the original. And uh, these lovely mask handles down at the bottom. Uh, and, and then you have the cricket stick holders here. Uh, again, all matching, all beautifully done. It's a complete set. And uh, there was a lot of interest in it. And it ended up selling for uh, well over its high estimate of 2.6 million Hong Kong, reaching 3.25 million Hong Kong, which is around roughly uh, $400,000, $420,000 US. But lots of demand for it. And uh, it just kept going on and on, really great. Then you have this, this sort of unusually decorated, but very attractive elephant head uh, handled uh, a vase, beautiful colors, somewhat atypical with this pattern on it, this patterning running around the body. These, it almost looks Japanese, but it's not, it's Chinese. Uh, but fabulous quality, again, uh, I love the, the elephant heads are sort of fat, uh, big fat elephant heads, very happy, uh, nice, nice big trunks on them and so forth. And again, you see this nice soft celadon green that was uh, sort of rare in the Qinlong period. And these beautiful little butterflies flying around the top. They're easy to miss. And then you have this fabulous patterning down here. Um, and, then, and, and then this step base with some relief work of Ruyi heads running around here. Fairly complicated, beautifully done. 
and uh, ended up uh, doing very well. It brought 1.2 million Hong Kong, or about $150,000 U.S., um, um, right in the uh, mid-range of its uh, high estimate. And then over to this, another imperial cloisonne enamel, archaistic form, um, uh, incense burner. Uh, this is, again, from the Smith Collection, ended up selling for 875000 Hong Kong. Uh, it, is, it was not marked, but it was beautiful quality, absolutely beautiful quality. It almost looks new when you look at these. The, the, the cloisonne pieces in the, in, the, in the Smith Collection were almost new looking. I was out there years ago, and it was really worth the trip. It's an old-fashioned museum in this big old mansion. It's very interesting. And uh, in Western Mass, not far from here. And uh, this is the base on it. Lovely, lovely thing. And these, these beautiful uh, spinning bosses going around the outside and these sort of implied archaistic masks in between uh, done sort of in an interpretive manner and then repeated down here. Very nicely done. And uh, as I said, 875000 or a little over $100,000 $100, U.S. Um, uh, very, very nice. And also, um, uh, this is not from the... Uh, uh, from the Smith Collection. This is from the uh, Yidi Tang Collection. And a very rare piece. This is an aubergine en enamel in underglazed blue dragon dish from the Wan Li period, Markin period. Uh, very unusual, beautifully shaped bowl. Absolutely beautifully shaped bowl. And the uh, application of the aubergine was flawless. Uh, aubergine is one of those color names that can get a little too watery, or a little too thin, doesn't come out right. And the outlining of the blue of the dragons. I loved how he did the tips of the dragon's claws in blue, but his legs were aubergine. Very clever mixture of uh, uh, components here. Nicely drawn, great looking expression on the dragon's face. Uh, all around, just a nice, nice bowl. Did very well. It had a two to three million Hong Kong estimate and ended up selling for 3.6 million or uh, up in the $400,000 range, but very, very rare. And this is not a big bowl. This bowl was six inches in diameter. These are not big, you know, like 12-inch bowls. They're quite, quite modest in size. But uh, very unusual color combination and beautifully done. Very beautifully done. And then over here to this, this is quite a little jar. This particular jar was done under the, uh, under, uh, the, the tutelage of, uh, during the Jai Jing period. And it was done at the Imperial Kilns. And they found, they believe they had the order for this, the, the documents for this from the kiln master, where he was ordered to make these albarello vases, uh, as they're known in, in Europe. Uh, and then they call them that on, the, on these for the shape, this albarello form, with a, a, a bluish ground sort of uh, commemorating Sung, Sung Blue, the Sung Blue glazes of the earlier period, and then done with these spectacular gilt work all over it. Absolutely great. Uh, and very, very rare. And they even have the name of the, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know who the, um, I read it years ago, but I couldn't remember the name, who the kiln master was then, because Tang Ying was the most famous kiln master. And this was um, uh, Ak Danga. Um, he was the superintendent of the imperial kilns at the, at the, at the, at the, at the at Chen at the time that this was made. And it says here that they found a list, contains a pair of gilt decorated albarello jars in the Sung Glaze which refers precisely to the present types of jars. And they believe this was one uh, that was ordered by an imperial edict and uh, ended up selling uh, for 7.4 million Hong Kong or about close to $900,000. But absolutely great piece. And these is, uh, how big are these? 12 inches tall, about a foot tall. And they were made in pairs, but this was just one of them. And uh, they have quite a bit of history on it because during the 18th century, the 19th century, they did keep very good records of orders to the kilns, who was working at the kilns, who was the director of the kiln. Um, when the order was completed, sometimes they, they know what room in the palace or what part of the palace the vase went to upon its return. So there's a lot of information that they can get these days. And then on to this. This was the, one of the big porcelain sales of the uh, series. This is the very, very rare Shunde uh, uh, Q form, uh, Q dragon uh, uh, jar. It's about six and a half or so inches tall. Uh, one of the uh, dragon, uh, Q dragon decorated jars are extremely rare. They began using them more in the Chen Hua period, but very, very rarely here. And it is based on the Makala, which is the uh, mythical beast of, I of Hindu culture adopted by the Chinese. And it's considered a protective spirit. It's a dragon. And they were drawn very, very rarely on porcelain during the Xuandi period. There's, I think there's maybe four of them known in the whole world. 
And they're rather unusual. They have this sort of wing shape to them. Let this thing pop up. Come on. There it is. We'll zoom this in. There we go. The photography on this was absolutely great. And if you pull it in, you know that you've heard them talk about the heaping and piling effect. Okay, this is heaping and piling. This is real um, early Ming, uh, the effect of the cobalt coming up through the glaze. But they shot this in such high, incredibly good high definition that you can get a very, very good uh, look at this at this uh, uh, Q and um, how they did it, how they drew it, and how they washed in the colors. And it's all absolutely fascinating, and it's an important creature. And you'll find these figures uh, carved into the bases of, of, of gates and things to important areas uh, within China, imperial areas, tombs, and so forth, as guardians. And uh, to see them on, on Xuande uh, porcelain is very, very rare. Most of them, I think all the major ones that are known are in the uh, uh, Palace Museum collections. I think there's one in England somewhere. Maybe at the, at the David collection or something. But that's about it. Uh, and this one was uh, sold to benefit the Robert Chang Educational uh, Foundation. Uh, Robert Chang, as many of you know, was a famous collector. Uh, 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 and it was, uh, let's see, sold at Christie's in 1988. Wow, it's been a while. And uh, uh, it's been exhibited many, many times. And it brought 31450000 or around four four and a half million dollars U.S. But very attractive, very, very beautiful piece of porcelain. And then on to this. This is an extreme rarity. This was made at the Imperial Workshops. It's a, a pousse in blue and black decorated uh, uh, covered jar. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, let's see, uh, what was the estimate on this? Two to three million um, Hong Kong dollars or, or roughly uh, 250 to $350,000. It made short work of that. It went up to 6.7 million or around $800,000 roughly. And uh, when you look at it in the description, it says it's uh, blue, pink, and puce, uh, and puce in black. And I said, where the heck is the black on this thing? It took me a minute. The eyes. <laughs> There's little black dots on the eyes. This is sort of interesting. But it has this graffito ground on it, which is interesting. And you've seen these, these were, this patterning, these, these sort of curled feather patterns, graffito, became very popular in the late Qing dynasty, um, 18... 60s, 80s, 90s through then, and you see lots of bowls with it on it, but it was first used really in the Qinlung period, and this was how they did it, and you can see how they picked it out and worked it in there. Uh, if you see something that predates the Qin, it's supposed to be older than the, you know, Qinlung, it's supposed to be Yong Chen or, or Kang Shi or Ming or anything, and it has graffito ground on it, put it down and run away, because it's a fake, because they didn't have it. That's one of those, it's one of those decorative elements that you, you know when it began, and they've written about it and so forth uh, uh, in the logs of the kilns and so forth. But anyway, this one is this bowl is beautifully decorated. The uh, the pink of the puce is very very attractive. The clouds are meticulously shaded. There's this beautiful gold rim, all original, absolutely great. And you notice how little wear there is on it. It's in splendid condition. But this was made in the imperial kiln, and um, ended up as I said selling for 6.7 million Hong Kong. Or you know seven hundred, seven hundred fifty, eight hundred thousand dollars, <throat> quite a thing. And both of these sales sort of did that whole, did this all the way through. They did very well. The great rarities did fabulously well. The average stuff did average prices. Uh, but the, 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 there seems to be a strengthening towards things that have been bought and assembled um, into the, the, of course, as always into the best collections, and things that have been collected from. Um, uh, in collections long ago, things that or came from famous collections that with some time in between, people uh, churning and burning stuff, picking it up in you know 2018, 19, and then trying to resell it in 2021 after a couple of years, uh, obviously trying to cash in in most cases, uh, unless they've had some radical change of lifestyle. Uh, some of it's speculative, and I have a feeling the people who have been speculating are going to have to wait a while before they make any money back. All right, if that's, if that's not why you buy art. You, you buy it because you love it, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm old-fashioned. I believe stuff like that. All right, now over to uh, what happened over on Bitamount last week with the weekly newsletter page. Um, pretty good week. By the way, we put this very nifty little video up here on uh, China uh, uh, West Meets East that the Metropolitan Museum did a few years ago. Uh, many of you have seen it, but I, I liked it particularly. And uh, this week's video, oh, I meant to mention, this week's video, I'm going to try and dig it out and put it in here. The second video this week on the newsletter page, uh, there was a, a very nice little thing they did about our hometown of Gloucester. And I thought some of you, that a lot of you have asked about what it's like, because we're, we're often called the other Cape. 
where Cape Ann and this Cape Cod, of course, which is much b better known, um, uh, and it's much larger. We're, we're fairly small, but there's a documentary, a little story that was done about about Cape Ann and and uh, our city, and I'm, I'm going to put it on there this week, and it, it sort of shows uh, what it's like to live here because I, I absolutely love it around here, and uh, and you can tell me what you think. Am I right? You can all move here. It's great, and uh, it's getting expensive though. Real estate. It's on the ocean, so it's it's like all oceanfront property. You know, it's it's getting up there, but at any rate, come up, come up, visit. And uh, this is the uh, newsletter from last week, and the prices were pretty good. A number of things on there haven't closed yet, like this very dandy, nifty pair of Japanese lanterns around there. They're only up to a couple hundred dollars over in Katawiki. We'll leave them in there for this week and uh, on and on. And there wasn't a huge amount of stuff on there last week. Uh, the, they've made some changes in eBay's algorithms so that the, the U.K. is now under a separate search thing. Uh, but I still think that there's a bit of a slowing of stuff on here. Um, uh, our own selling website seems to be picking up more people, though, which is good. Uh, maybe we're getting some some transplants and so forth. They've been coming over to bid them out live. Uh, more listings. They noticed a number of sales this week. They, a couple of people sold some very nice things. Uh, I was happy to see that. I want people to sell things. So let's go over and check it out. All right. Because it, it, eBay, this talk at eBay, there, there was somebody somebody on one of the uh, affiliate boards mentioned that there's, there's a discussion about, if not eliminating the antique category, reducing it greatly or consolidating it all to, into one sort of pot, which I think is a terrible idea, but that's just my opinion. All right, now over here, this was over on Katowiki last week, it was this very nice Wanley period bridge handled, um, uh, pe one of those quick sort of pencil drawn cobalt blue uh, teapots, but it was a beautiful one. It was an overall quite good condition, it had a couple little nicks out of the spout as I recall, and maybe a small hairline under the lid. I think that was about it. And somebody picked this up for 800 euros or around, uh, what's that come out to? About $950, which I think was a really good buy because we've, we've seen these in the past. Virtually identical ones sell for $1,500, $1,600, and so forth. And uh, this one was estimated at 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, uh, euros, which is about right. And somebody got a great buy, you know. Uh, they left a bid on it, and they got it. Bravo. And then over here to this was this uh, 18th century uh, mold relief work, Yixing unmarked teapot that was on eBay, but very nicely done, nice proportions. I love the spout with this sort of root uh, root vine hollow spot in it and so forth. And again, they em emulated it over here and this, this these two squirrels tossing on top of it, just charming. Ended up selling for $1,536. Uh, this was from Chamberlain's uh, Antiques. Josh had this up. Juice 1499. He had most of the, the sort of the more expensive things on here. There's a number of things, but he had a lot of good stuff on there last week. And then there was this, this very nice big Femi Ver garden planter. This was a monster of a garden planter. This was over on eBay, uh, but beautiful coloring. It's a late, late 19th century example, but very well decorated. All of the figures are nicely done in this little court scene here with the banners flying around it. Nice, clear yellow under the rim. And uh, the bottom of it looked absolutely right for uh, uh, the late Qing Dynasty, 1870 to 1900, somewhere in there, uh, maybe a little after. And uh, you can tell by the bottom of it when you look at these. First thing you notice, it's, it's quite white and smooth, and you see the, you can actually still see the turning lines in it. Very nicely done. And it's got this sort of semi-V shape with a rounded end here, on uh, here, uh, on, the, on the foot. And it almost looks like smooth compacted almost like cement at times on these big pieces you also see it this this appearance on large uh, uh, uh familial rose rose mandarin vases have very similar feet on them sometimes they're glazed underneath sometimes they're not this one was not glazed planters are often not glazed underneath for some reason uh, but you can see the hand trimming that went around it it's beautifully done nice big piece and uh, somebody liked it quite a lot and they paid forty six hundred and eighty three dollars for it uh, which was, was was a pretty good price, and this was being sold in the UK. One of the things I found interesting was was that the uh, 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 the shipping from the UK to here, if I had bought this or somebody had bought it, that's a big piece of porcelain, was only $180. So uh, this is uh, uh, Nafisa. He's a regular seller over there. He's got a lot of feedback, sells a lot of stuff, and uh, that's a very reasonable shipping rate for that. I would have thought the shipping on that would have been over 300 bucks. It's a big piece of porcelain. It's going to require a monstrous box. But anyway, it was a very nice piece, and I hope so. If one of you got it, put a plant in it, put a nice big tree in it, and put it in your yard. Enjoy it. And then back to this. This was the uh, the uh, uh, Hung Chong 
uh, a, a dragon bamboo leg tea set that was being sold by Super Shrink. Uh, it was a lovely thing. It was up to about eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars when we looked at it last week. Uh, I liked the base on it a lot. I loved I loved the con con continuity of the the bamboo legs and then the bamboo supports and then the bamboo spout and then the double bamboo handle on top and this little bamboo handle um, here on the lid. I liked the whole way it was done and then with this fierce relief work dragon coming up off of it. Just absolutely lovely. And uh, it ended in the end doing about what we thought it would do. These have, we've seen these this form before. It's a, it was a very popular type. Ended up selling for twenty nine hundred and thirty eight dollars. Uh, jumped another thousand dollars over over what it was last week. It was waiting to close on the twenty third, which was a few days ago, four days, five days ago. But nice looking pot. And then back over to this was this Ming marked uh, vase. This is a late Qing vase, and uh, I, we talked about it last last week with these uh, with these uh, court figures on it. Beautifully done all the way around. Very unusual though. This is quite an unusual little covered jar. Uh, uh, very or vase rather, very nicely done. Uh, good sharp colors, nice details. You notice all the whiskers. Each one is drawn in individually, and then the, the sort of honeycomb patterns on the on his uniform, and so forth. Here's a, 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 a figure kept with swords and a bow and all that. A lady going hunting, uh, some sort of court scene maybe. And uh, it ended up selling for $2,988. And this was not a big vase. This was, well, you know, terribly big. It was just a foot tall. Uh, and it just got a lot of interest. I thought it was quite striking. I think it was late Qing, you know, last half of the 19th century and all that. But very fine quality. And did have a Ming mark on it, but it doesn't mean anything. It's just apocryphal. Uh, but the, the vase, somebody really, a number of people really liked this vase. It got 44 bids, did just fine. A nice looking pot. And then over here to this, the export plate with the bamboo and peony trees and so forth. Uh, very nicely done. Interesting spacing. Just a good, solid, late 18th century dinner platter. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you entertain a lot, buy one of these for serving a roast beef on. Um, they're absolutely great. $262. If you, go, if, you know, if you go to a fancy department store and you look at a great piece of heron or something, it's going to cost you more than that. Uh, so, so why not buy a nice antique and use it? Um, and this was a nice one. Uh, and as I said, it went for just $262 plus $28 or $39 in shipping from the, from the UK. Not a bad deal at all. And then there was this, the Kangxi Bowl. This was a sort of good-sized bowl with figures on it. It was beautifully done. I think it was 10 inches in diameter. <clears throat> Lots of figural activity on it all the way around. Nice-looking uh, 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 figures and faces. The faces, of course, outlined in red. Here's a shot of the interior. All right, not tiny, tiny bits of wear to the interior. A little bit of wear, it looks like up in here maybe, but not anything uh, uh, too too damaging at all. But this was a big bowl. It was 10 inches in diameter. It was all in Femi Ver. These nice blue, nice cobalts, the river in red, and so on and so forth. Quite an interesting pot. Lots of figures, and that makes them expensive. Once they get into the size, the price jumps up quite a bit. And uh, somebody picked it up for 9,600 euros. It was estimated at 10 to 11,000 euros, so I suspect he just got over the, um, just over the reserve. Uh, whoever was selling it was cutting it pretty close, uh, but it was a beautiful, beautiful piece, and it's uh, uh, it has the emperor um, Kangxi Ya Kangxi, and, uh, and uh, on the Wei River. I mean, that's the Red River that was in the background. I guess they did the research on it. And um, what else do you need to know? That was it. Well, it takes okay, and. Uh, Ended up selling for 9,600 euros for about $11,000 plus shipping. And then on to this, this very nifty little Daosai enamel, non-imperial, sort of uh, 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 unofficial kiln output, Gongshu, uh, Mark and Period cup, but nicely done. The pattern you've all seen before. Most often you see this, this same exact pattern, and it's done only in underglazed blue. This one they did it in Daosai enamels. Uh, very good looking. Here's a picture of the bottom of it. You see that sort of latish 19th century gritty foot like you see on lots of porcelains, uh, but that's okay. It wasn't imperial, but, but a beautiful example and a small cup, small wine cup. Did pretty well though. It sold for almost $300. $292 bought it, uh, but nice, nice example, unusual colors, and mark, and I believe of the period from what I could see. So that's perfectly good buy. All right, and then over here, this was something else that uh, uh, Josh had, uh, Chamberlain Antiques had, was this very, nice several robes up. Uh, it was this very nice one with uh, butterflies on it, late Qing to Republic period, 
beautiful, beautiful yellow sleeves. And overall, it looked to be in great condition. That was the good thing about this robe. It was in beautiful, beautiful shape. Notice how strong the colors are. Uh, these colors, often you see them, they're sort of muted um, to soft pinks, you know, a little bit softer. Uh, this is how they should look, bright and vibrant and strong and very festive. Love the pink peach in the middle and the other fruit, this persimmon and the pomegranates, the citron fingers and all that business. And uh, a lot of people liked it. It ended up selling for $1,826. It was pretty good for an informal uh, ladies coat uh, uh, robe. Not bad, not bad at all. And then over to this, this was another robe he had up, which is quite unusual. There's a peony with a, uh, a, a over, overlaying a Buddha swastika within a rondelle. And you notice the swastika is reversed, which is quite unusual. Uh, well, it's not terribly unusual, but it is unusual. Because they did them in both directions, the wheel spinning and, and, you know, until 1930, this was considered to be a very auspicious, good symbol for lots of cultures, the swastika. And uh, you know who ruined that. But uh, it used to mean, you know, prosperity, happiness, the, 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 the footprint of, of, of Buddha and so forth. And here they have it with a blossoming and peony coming over the, over the swastika and beautifully done, sworn into this fabric. And this robe dates to the late Qing, early Republic period, I would guess. Ended up selling for $1,625. It was an informal day coat sort of thing, probably for a woman. But lovely colors and beautiful condition. All right, and then on to this was the jade uh, figure uh, of the uh, Kuan Yin standing with her scepter. Nice looking, uh, nice looking carving, holding her fan and, and, oh, and some, uh, what are those up there? I think she's carrying balloons or not. I think it's some sort of device. At any rate, uh, ended up selling for $918 which I think was perfectly fine. It was a late Qing to Republic piece, but a good little carving. And the one thing I wanted to point out was that there's a seller over in uh, Malaysia that uh, uh, let me know. He's had, he, he's had um, um, these uh, Nonya Straits pieces on before. Um, you can't scratch my neck with this thing on. It's a pain in the neck. Um, and, he, and he put up a bunch of them just at fixed price to see if people would like them that way better. Uh, this was a nice example. $300. Buy it now. Make an offer. They're in the newsletter. I think there are five or six of them. Uh, he's, he's a good source for these pieces. He knows the stuff. These are legit old pieces. He's a good dealer. Um, and uh, I know some people that actually know this guy. And uh, he's very nice. And uh, this is a good-looking Nonya Strait uh, plate. And there's several others in there that range upwards to eight to $900, depending on the pattern. You want to check those out. And then we have a whole bunch of things that we'll be putting in this week's newsletter. And uh, we updated the uh, Global Member pages uh, Wednesday. Uh, managed to do that like this. <laughs> and uh, we'll be updating again tomorrow on Saturday. We try to do it at least twice a week. We do little updates during the week in between as things appear. And um, if you haven't uh, signed up yet over at Bit Amount Live, uh, to sell or buy or do something, go over there and do it. Go over there and do it. It's growing. We're, we've got now several hundreds of listings. It's, it's coming along nicely, and uh, it's getting picked up more and more. I can tell you by Google Analytics, it's turning up in search results. And uh, the more you put on there, the more your site is going to grow because it really is It's for you guys. I, I, I've sort of set the thing up, and I want to see what you do with it. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. If you haven't subscribed yet here, please do. If you haven't joined us over at bitamount.com, or bit about live, please do use the site, use the reference material, enjoy it. Have a fabulous weekend, and uh, see you next time. And thank you for your patience. Those of you who emailed me this weekend, I was slow to get, I was hard to get back. Um, I'm a terrible one-handed typist. I have to tell you, it's embarrassing. All right, thanks so much. Bye bye.